for joining us for this webinar on the women who built Reed Hall, artists, radicals, and visionaries. My name is Krista Forey, and I'm the operations manager for the Columbia Global Center in Paris, which resides at Reed Hall. I'm here with Dr. Brunhild Bibuk, Reed Hall's administrative director, and Meredith J. Levin, Western European Humanities Librarian at Columbia University Libraries. Together, they've worked tirelessly for over three years to piece together the sometimes forgotten, often surprising history of Cat Rue de Chiffreuse. Reed Hall, which has been owned and operated by Columbia University since 1964, has a rich history that features almost exclusively women. Today's talk will focus on two distinct iterations of the space, the American Girls Art Club, followed by the American University Women's Club. Their importance in artistic and academic circles cannot be understated, as they were the first of their kind to afford American women in Paris the freedom of expression and the support of a community, which were paramount to the evolution of their characters and to the development of their talents. Still today, Reed Hall is largely operated by a group of women, and we all owe a debt of gratitude to the trailblazing visionaries who were here before us, most notably Elizabeth Mills Reed, in honor of whom Reed Hall was named. Brune, Meredith, thank you both for being here. Shall we begin? Is the legend that Reed Hall was once the hunting lodge of the Duchess of Chevreuse true? There are lots of legends that circulate about Reed Hall. And some people even suggest that ghosts of yesteryear still wander about the premises. But one of the oldest legends maintains that Four Rue de Chevreuse was the epicenter of Marie de Rouen's court intrigues and love affairs. This romantic legend is so compelling that sources still represent it as fact, even though it was debunked in 1931 by the medieval historian and Reed Hall resident, Dorothy McKay. Her article entitled Reed Hall, A Relic of Old Paris, revealed that Marie de Rouen and her second husband, the Duc de Chevreuse, never even lived anywhere near Reed Hall, and that the underground passage to the Luxembourg Palace, which she supposedly used to join her lovers, actually led to many quarries that honeycombed the area prior to the French Revolution. In fact, much of Paris was built from under the ground up, and close to 200 miles of subterranean galleries still exist today. When we renovated one of our buildings, we actually visited the underground passage referred to in the legend. And while we ventured far enough to see beautifully conceived masonry passages with vaulted ceilings, none led to the palace. Meredith? Yeah, I think sadly, this site was never a Bridgerton or a Versailles. Uh, the main buildings were constructed in the 18th century, but they changed hands continuously. First, there were porcelain factories the most famous one owned by the Dagotee brothers, whose clients included the Empress Josephine, the British royal family, and at least two US presidents. Then in the 1820s, the property was converted into an orthopedic practice where disabled women and children were treated. Next came the Keller Institute, which was France's first Protestant boys' school, owned by Jean-Jacques Keller and his family from 1834 to 1890. The boys who lived at the school received a rigorous religious education and came from important families around the world. One of the most famous alumni was the French writer, André Gide. Then at the end of the 19th century, Elizabeth Mills Reed came to dramatically change the course of history when she leased this property in 1893, and then she bought it a few years later from the Keller family. Can you give us an idea of what we now call Reed Hall and its surrounds, what they were like in the late 1800s? Uh, the best description of the street in the late 1800s is given by the grandson of Jean-Jacques Keller, who had established the Protestant boarding school for young men. In his recollection, it was an ugly little street that linked the Boulevard du Montparnasse to the Rue Notre-Dame-des-Champs. Not one bit aristocratic, despite the name of this poor street a few buildings with housing for workers or petit bourgeois, and facing number four, two wine merchants on the ground floor. The remaining buildings were rather seedy furnished hotels. At the corner of the Rue Notre-Dame-des-Champs, there was another wine merchant whose house extended into the street, which caused the most unbearable kinds of bottleneck. 
With time, this house became a ruin, a ruin that had no poetic charm. The contrast between the street and the oasis nestled behind the facade of Four Rue de Chevreuse is striking. An 1894 resident best summarizes the wonderment experienced by all those who enter this other world. When the great portes are open, we catch a glimpse of the sunny court with a garden behind. The house extends around three sides of the paved court. In the center is a large flower bed filled with scarlet geraniums, hollyhocks, and roses. An old well has been covered over and transformed into a pansy bed. And here and there are boxes overflowing with gay nasturtiums. The tall trees and shrubs in the garden shield the court from the view of neighboring houses. And in the pleasant seclusion, the noisy, dusty boulevard seems very far away. Not much has changed since her days. The courtyard and garden abound in flower beds. The well is still there. And the pride of today's Reed Hall is its 200 year old sprawling Judas tree that blooms gloriously every spring. Lovely. One thing that certainly has changed is I can't imagine anyone walking into Reed Hall now and saying that it has no poetic charm in any event. Can you talk a little about what Montparnasse as a neighborhood was like at that same time? Uh, you know, Montparnasse has long been the home of artists, even way before the American colony moved in. We go back to 1867. Paul Cézanne was spending winters in Paris in a studio at 5 Rue de Chevreuse, which is just across the street from Reed Hall. Then John Singer Sargent was sharing a studio with another painter around the corner on Rue Notre-Dame de Champs in the 1870s. There were also many ateliers and academies, including Julien, Colarossi, Viti, Delecluse, and others all in this one area. Whistler moved his studio to Montparnasse in 1892, and he then opened his own art school, which was very popular with American women. So we had all the academies and the art teachers in this one concentrated area. So of course the American students would flock to the neighborhood as well. Then if we move into the interwar period, we had the so-called lost generation of expatriate writers, artists, and intellectuals. They chose to live in Montparnasse because they were following this artistic tradition, but also they just wanted to be near the decadent nightlife. All of the great historic cafes, the Dome, the Select, La Rotonde, La Coupole, La Closerie de Lila, dancing halls like the Balboulier, landmarks like Gertrude Stein's apartment and Pablo Picasso's studios, all of these spaces made the area an American hotspot in the 1920s and 1930s. So Reed Hall was really surrounded by some of the greatest avant-garde thinkers and writers and artists of the 20th century cafes and studios and dance halls and everything amazing. So we've already established that Reed Hall uh, was named after Elizabeth Mills Reed. Can you tell us maybe why Elizabeth chose to establish a club for women artists here? Elizabeth Mills Reed was a Francophile from the day she set foot in Paris to attend Madame Vallette's finishing school for wealthy young women and joined the American community associated with the Church of the Holy Trinity, now the American Cathedral. In fact, she received her confirmation at Holy Trinity in 1874, alongside John Singer Sargent. Years later, when her husband Whitelaw Reed, owner of the New York Tribune, which then became the New York Herald Tribune, was named American ambassador to France from 1889 to 1892, Elizabeth rejoined Holy Trinity. There, she met Reverend Newell and his wife, who out of concern for the well-being of young American artists living in Paris, had established a space and social activities for those who were so far from the comforts of home. Reed, whose husband supported the Men's Art Association of Paris, which had opened in 1890, was especially interested in establishing a similar facility for American women. Through the Newells and Holy Trinity, uh, Reed discovered that Four Rue de Chevreuse was vacant and an ideal location for an art club at the heart of what was then known as the American Corner. 
Virginia Gildersleeve, longtime Dean of Barnard College, best summarizes Reed's philanthropic gesture. Of all the very wealthy persons I have known, Mrs. Reed seems to me the most sound and just, least open to flattery and most interested in the human touch, in the welfare of individuals. When her husband was American ambassador to France, she wanted to provide better care and a happier social life for American girls studying art and music in Paris. And so she established and supported the American Girls Art Club in the charming old building on the Rue de Chevreuse. This enterprise furthered also the Franco-American relationship to which she and her husband were at the time especially dedicated. Uh, why then was the American Women's Art Association created at the Art Club? The American Women's Art Association, or the AWAA as we call it, was very much a product of the late 19th century. There had been no formal arts organizations for American women in Paris, so they founded one for themselves with the primary aim of organizing exhibitions. Their first show opened before the Girls Art Club even existed on March 1st, 1893 at the Newell's Reading Rooms in the neighborhood. The exhibition jury included Elizabeth Norse, Kathleen Greaterex, and Ellen Kendall Baker, who were three of the elder stateswomen among the artists in Paris at that time. Then, once the American Girls Art Club officially opened in fall 1893, it became the natural home for the AWAA's exhibitions, and it also served as its headquarters. There were some women who enjoyed successful careers as regulars at the prestigious Paris salons, but many others really depended on the AWAA exhibitions as their sole opportunities to share and sell their work. Over the course of its 20 year history, the association mounted around 30 exhibitions, giving hundreds of painters, sculptures, miniaturists, a platform to really showcase their skills. Painters like Anne Goldthwaite, Florence Este, and Mary McManus all took turns leading the association. And the exhibitors were a veritable who's who of 19th and 20th century American women artists. Local newspapers in the US would often print brief articles about the exhibitions over the years, particularly when one of their hometown heroines was included in the shows. But it was really the New York Herald which had its own Paris bureau and a pretty substantial European edition that would publish these full page spreads for nearly all the annual shows, sometimes even with pictures. The AWAA seems to have been unique in its long-term support of American women artists. Uh, the, the exhibitions were organized by several committees and each varnishing day gathered as many as 200 to 400 sympathizers from the American colony and the Parisian artistic community. This festive day was always accompanied by food and drink and some form of entertainment, usually a musical concert. Unlike the Men's Association, which moved to various locations in Montparnasse, the AWAA remained at Four Rue de Chevreuse for its entire lifespan. If not for World War I, there is no doubt that the AWAA would have continued to grow in size and prominence. Mm. Did the First World War force uh, all of the American women artists to vacate the property? In the chaos surrounding the outbreak of World War I, the club, so long a haven for American women, hastily exiled its residents as disaster loomed. In 1914, Mrs. Reed completely transformed the property into a military hospital serving the needs of the French and then the American Red Cross caring for wounded officers. The place housed doctor's offices, nurses stations, an operating room, a sterilizing room, rooms and wards for recovering soldiers, a kitchen and dining room. The gardens were of course quite a benediction for all concerned. Reed financed a good part of this enterprise for the duration of the conflict and after 1918, when Four Rue de Chevreuse became the administrative headquarters of the American Red Cross. When the Americans entered the war in 1917, a fundamentally important initiative was undertaken by artist Anna Ladd, who founded the studio for portrait masks. To do so, she benefited from the atelier of Janet Scudder, one of the most prominent women artists ever associated with our address. 
Funded initially by LAD, the studio was then picked up by the Red Cross, whose headquarters were at Fort Chevreuse. Ultimately, the studio was funded by the, the French Ministry of Health and moved from the Rue Notre-Dame-des-Champs to the Hôpital du Val-de-Grâce. The wounded were sent to the studio for portrait masks after they had healed from extensive surgery. Molds were made of their mutilated faces, and these molds then served to fashion tin masks that concealed specific wounds and were painted to match skin color. Such masks provided these traumatized soldiers with the internal and external healing, including the restoration of the self-esteem that had been stripped from them through the horrors of war. None but an artist could have accomplished such satisfactory results. Club resident and confirmed Francophile Grace Cassette also contributed significantly to the war effort. She used her artistic talents to produce orthopedic appliances that prevented amputations, repaired paralyzed limbs and relieved pain and pressure and gave maximum comfort to soldiers with severed nerves. By 1917, she and her colleagues had supplied 50 military hospitals with 6,000 of her devices. She not only pursued this activity after the armistice, but also created workshops where war-weary Americans and French soldiers came together to socialize. Both Ladd and Gassette were decorated with the cross of the Legion of Honor for their contributions in easing the lives of disabled French soldiers. Did any of the other women artists um, stay in France to help with the war effort? Well, many of the artists who had once resided at the Girls Art Club joined the war effort. Some stayed in Europe, many went back to the US. They either volunteered in field hospitals, drove ambulances, or were on the front lines, or they would raise money for wounded soldiers and their families. At the start of the war, Elizabeth Norris decided to remain in Paris in her longtime studio on the Rue d'Assas. She resolved to stay, saying that she and her sister would feel like cowards to desert now after all the kindness we have received from France. She then published extracts from her diary in a journal called Art and Progress, meant to share all of these horrific experiences with the American public. And in June 1915, she described all of the charitable canteens that had sprung up around Paris to feed all of the poor artists who were unable to work because of the war. The majority of American artists went back to the US and they did try to support the war effort from a distance. One of the most substantial fundraising events was this two week Alley Festa that was held in 1917. And it was an Italian style festival and carnival organized by the residents of McDougal Alley in New York, a street at that time that was filled with artist studios and apartments. The sculptor and heiress Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney was one of the leaders of this highly successful event. And they raised nearly $63,000 for the American Red Cross and the Allied War Charities. Whitney temporarily transformed her own three-story sculpture studio into an alfresco dining room, there were games of chance, all kinds of vendors, and even a Red Cross dancing hall. Club sculptor Alice Morgan Wright was also a notable participant. Her booth was decked out from top to bottom in blue and yellow, the colors of suffrage war relief, as suffrage was a passion close to her heart. And then another girls art club sculptor, Melvina Hoffman, ran a soda fountain at the Festa. So all of these contributions by American artists it really wasn't about patriotism. There was this outpouring of gratitude and a sincere commitment to France since so many artists had lived and studied and launched their careers there. After the war, um, this space was transformed into the University Women's Club. Why did this happen? For what purpose uh, did it transition or transform? Elizabeth Mills Reed had her sights set on continuing the art club. Although she had been approached by a number of institutions interested in claiming the space for their projects, none interested her. However, she changed her mind about what the space might become upon hearing a most interesting proposal from a group of women affiliated with colleges in the United States. Spearheaded by Virginia Gildersleeve, who had just collaborated in the 1919 founding of the International Federation of University Women, this group included Bryn Mawr's president and wealthy alumnae, including Elizabeth's daughter-in-law, Helen Rogers-Reed. 
college educated and aware of their powers as independent women, they formed a tightly knit coterie of women's rights advocates. They were convinced that opening a residential clubhouse for American women and graduates in Paris would facilitate the needs of the growing number of women interested in French American relations after World War I. They were also convinced that it would serve as a convenient hub for conferences, enhancing the prospects for building networks of international university women. Most importantly, the group proposed to alleviate Reed's financial burden of supporting the club by raising funds through tuition and membership fees. Ultimately, Elizabeth Reed was convinced that university women should benefit from the privilege of a dedicated club, with the one caveat that female artists had to be included. The University Women's Club was thus officially born in 1922. The experiment proved to be so successful that the Reed family continued to partially subsidize the undertaking, making Four Rue de Chevreuse a unique location for French American intellectual exchange through 1939, when its activities were brought to a halt by the onset of yet another world war. Meredith, is there anything you'd like to add to that? You know, there was serious interest in internationalism in the immediate aftermath of World War I. That was supposed to be the war to end all wars. So many educated women like Gildersleeve were heavily involved in these international peace movements. They were also interested in promoting understanding between like-minded women from different countries, again, as a way to stave off another major conflict. They had this utopian kind of feminist vision for a club where debate and scholarly conversation in the sciences and humanities, international cooperation could all thrive. Prominent women like Frances Perkins and Doris Stevens came to Paris on business and they would either stay at the club or they would come to address the residents, which would ensure that everyone remained engaged and informed. But it wasn't just about academia. As Bruin just mentioned, Mrs. Reed was adamant that the club still welcome artists either as residents or just as users of the studios on the property. So women from Russia, New Zealand, many other countries all took advantage of this opportunity, as did Lucy Perkins Ripley, who was an American painter, sculptor, and ceramicist. She had been an AWAA exhibitor way back in 1905, and then she came back to use one of the club studios in the 1920s. Can you talk a little bit about the interactions between the women who lived and worked at Reed Hall or at the club with their Montparnasse neighbors and I guess really with, with Parisians in general? While both clubs were perceived as protective cocoons, the residents were clearly not severed from outside influences and interactions. In fact, many club members traveled extensively throughout France, to Normandy, Brittany, and the Côte d'Azur, but also throughout Europe, especially Holland and Italy, and to North Africa and even Japan. And they painted, drew, or researched as they traveled, enhancing their Paris-based experiences with insights gained from contact with other countries, cultures, and even languages. Club residents were also engaged in the social whirlwind of Montparnasse. Numerous cafes, restaurants, and cabarets were frequented by artists, and many, many catered to an American clientele, like the Dango American Bar and the Jockey Club, which was decorated in the style of a Western saloon. One restaurant, not far from Rue de Chevreuse, a favorite with American women was a small crèmerie named Chez Henriette. It had been decorated by two residents of the art club with frescoes narrating the English poem and nursery rhyme, The Queen of Hearts, which the artists blithely transformed into the Queen of Tarts. I would like to talk about the, the vibrant nightlife of Montparnasse, which literally surrounded Reed Hall on all sides. Uh, in the 1920s, there was even a nightclub called The Jungle on the corner of Boulevard Montparnasse and Rue de Chevreuse. So even if the club was meant to be a sanctuary for its residents, there could have been no way to avoid the all-night parties at the bars and restaurants of the quarter. The Abbe Ernest Dimney, who was a longtime friend and neighbor of Reed Hall, 
wrote this kind of quaint article about the culture of Montparnasse in 1935. And he described the advantages of being so near these Bohemian hangouts, but still safely ensconced in the club. And he said, as a matter of fact, American women are happier in so-called Bohemian Paris than their more unbridled brothers, because decency is necessary to every declaration of independence. And if you spend all your freedom in licentious rioting, there is nothing left to be spent. I suspect that the college girls in Reed Hall secure the maximum enjoyment from being so near the Dome and the Rotonde, while all the time preening their wings in their coy Rue de Chevreuse. Now, Dimne would have everybody believe that the club's residents never ventured into the Balboulier or drank at any of the cafes, but we know that is simply not true. One young student named Crystal Ross, who would become one of the first American women to receive a doctorate in France in 1925, stayed briefly at the club in 1924. She was in Paris visiting her soon-to-be fiance, the poet, John Dos Passos, and he introduced her to Ernest Hemingway and Hadley Richardson at La Closerie de Lila. At the bar, the group decided, as young people do, to hike over the Pyrenees and visit Pamplona for the annual Feria del Toro. Now, Ross and Dos Passos ultimately broke up not too long after, and it doesn't appear that she kept in touch with Hemingway, but he immortalized her as a character in The Sun Also Rises. What makes you so sure that the women of Reed Hall were out and about gallivanting? Were they like, was it licentious rioting or was it coyly preening their wings? Like, where's the proof? I think it was kind of a combination of the two. Um, one of the most iconic figures from this period is Kiki, the so-called queen of Montparnasse, a cabaret singer, a dancer, a portrait painter, and the model and muse for everyone from Man Ray to Modigliani to Fujita, all the major modern artists working in the neighborhood. Now she was such an outsized presence in this neighborhood. There's no way that the girls living at the club were not aware of her. She definitely took notice of them because she writes about them in her 1930 memoir. And she says, Montparnasse, so picturesque, so colorful. All the peoples of the earth have come here to pitch their tents. And yet it's all just like one big family. In the morning, you can see young fellows in wide trousers and fresh cheeked young girls on their way to the art schools, to Vateaux, to Polarossi's, the Grand Chaumière, etc. Later, the cafe terraces begin to fill up and pretty Americans eating oatmeal can be seen sitting side by side the French. So there they were with their oatmeal. I just, I don't, why the oatmeal though? I mean, <laughs> That's the most American thing she could think of, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> For university women, the club was ideally located close to the Sorbonne and to other schools. But many women also engaged individually in research projects with French scholars. One example is Mary Boyle, who worked with the famed prehistorian of France, the Abbé Breuil. They were close collaborators for the last 37 years of Breuil's life. Boyle not only translated several of his books into English, but also conducted field work by his side. And she was responsible for hundreds of petroglyph drawings in color. She also published monographs that were fundamental to research in prehistory. Yet, like so many women of the 20th century, Boyle was not fully recognized in her own right. Nor was she even credited as being the crucial collaborator in Breuil's research and field studies. Can we transition a little bit and talk about uh, the leadership, the women who led the property um, through, through the 19th and 20th century? There were rather many women who led the property, but uh, really, I think we feel that the most remarkable was Barnard alumna Dorothy Leet, who became uh, the University Women's Club director in 1926. She steered the property through the Great Depression and through the tumultuous 1930s, stepping down in 1938 as the world lurched toward another catastrophic war. And then she returned as president in 1947 and rekindled Reed Hall's place in American education, creating study abroad programs for American colleges and universities. But that's another story. Under her leadership in the 20s and 30s, Reed Hall hosted a wide range of activities, which included 
luncheons and evening concerts, weekly talks over tea, bi-monthly receptions and monthly dinners with keynote speakers. Ironically, many of the guest speakers were part of the male intelligentsia at the Sorbonne, the Collège de France, and other French and international cultural and educational institutions. But Leet also made sure that women's voices were heard by promoting the club's ties with the International Federation of University Women and its French chapter. Guests and residents addressed such issues as women's rights and the roles that women played in international politics, diplomacy, law, economics, and governance. Though she was no Kiki, Lee was an outsized presence in her own right. She spoke several European languages and was a seasoned traveler. In addition to the kindness she bestowed upon Reed Hall's residents and her exceptional skills as an administrator and leader, she worked tirelessly as an ambassador for French American Amity. In recognition of her work in international relations and education, the French government decorated her on five separate occasions, ultimately naming her as commander of the Legion of Honor and of the Order of Ac Academic Palms. This is really consequential leadership from Dorothy Lee. But it's also really important to stress, again, the financial support that the property received from Elizabeth Mills Reed for 40 years. From 1893 to 1931, she was the primary and unwavering patron who enabled the different clubs to grow and to evolve. Of course, the property was renamed Reed Hall in her honor around 1928. And then when she died in 1931, it was this other incredible woman, her daughter-in-law, Helen Rogers Reed, who continued the family's patronage for several more decades. Now, Helen, of course, was a Barnard graduate, a close friend of Dean Gildersleeve, and she had even been Elizabeth's secretary before marrying her son, Ogden Mills Reed. So this made her the perfect candidate to succeed Elizabeth as the primary patroness of Reed Hall. And also we can't forget that it was Helen who gifted Reed Hall to Columbia University in 1964, securing its future, but also the Reed family legacy of philanthropy. Since we've begun this, um, this webinar, there's been mention made of various causes, um, suffragettes, some activism. Uh, were the women of Reed Hall activists for any particular causes? Um, and do you think they were maybe socially progressive or more conservative in your opinion? Where did, where did they stand? Well, in so many respects, Virginia Gildersleeve, uh, who was Dean of Barnard College for 36 years and, and who headed Reed Hall's board of directors for two decades, was a pioneer who paved the way for young women in education, administration, leadership, and civic responsibility. Her activities and creations are really telling examples of her profound commitment to women and internationalism. Together with her partner, Carolyn Spurgeon, the first woman to hold a professorship at the University of London and a distinguished scholar of Chaucer and Shakespeare, Gildersleeve helped found in 1919, the International Federation of University Women. She also encouraged the founding of the French chapter of this federation, which is still active at Reed Hall today. Gildersleeve's 1954 autobiography, Many a Good Crusade, protested against the discrimination toward women who chose to remain celibate or spend their lives with other women. And outside of her many contributions to Reed Hall, she also ensured that it provided favorable opportunities for university women who led an unconventional existence. One of the most remarkable aspects of life at both the Girls Art Club and the University Women, Women's Club was this openness surrounding same-sex couples. In the art club era, we had noted artists, uh, Ethel Mars and Maud Hunt Squire, both of whom frequently exhibited at AWAA shows at the club. They lived in Paris together from 1906 to 1915, and they were the models for Gertrude Stein's 1910 poem, Miss Fur and Miss Skeen, in which they were described by Stein as gay. And this is one of the first known uses of the term to denote homosexuality. And that poem is still considered a landmark of LGBTQ literature. And by the time we get to the University Women's Club, 
there are a number of well-known same-sex couples. Brune already mentioned Virginia Gildersleeve and Caroline Spurgeon, but also Dorothy Leet was in a long-term relationship with Sarah Porter, a Wellesley graduate who also worked at the University Women's Club. And then there were Jane Harrison and Hope Mirlees. They were British intellectuals and scholars who moved from Cambridge to Paris together and they lived at the club from 1922 to 1925. Harrison was a major classicist at Cambridge University where she had tutored her partner in Greek. Uh, she was also 37 years older than Mirlees. But Harrison was such a major figure that the board of the University Women's Club elected her an honorary member of the club for life, which was a signal of their deep respect. So, I mean, I could keep going on, but you know, this, this progressive attitude towards sexuality really pervaded both eras and you know, you get the idea. Uh, what would you say were the general stereotypes about women artists in the late 19th and early 20th century? The women who came uh, to the art club and the university club left the constraints of puritanical America and experienced the many freedoms afforded by the intense social, artistic, intellectual, and international spirit that reigned in Paris at the turn of the century and up to World War II. As artists, however, these women frequently had to overcome significant prejudices in the male-dominated art world. It was said that women couldn't become good sculptors, that they didn't have the physical prowess or skill to cut their own stone or to put it in the physical labor, that they should focus on feminine subjects, landscapes and genre scenes, mother and daughter portraits, flowers and gardens, interiors, miniature portraits, religious themes or allegories. In order to gain recognition, women who broke out of the mold often presented their work under a male pseudonym. And if they acquired critical acclaim under their own name, they were often said to paint or sculpt like a man. As a group, women artists were often viewed as dabblers. And when they were compared to their male counterparts, they were criticized as derivative or praised, as dainty, delicate, or sensitive. The the men, on the other hand, were seen as bold, groundbreaking, and modern. Women with artist husbands were often overshadowed, barely figuring as footnotes in their biographies. Even today, their stories are obscured and must be pieced together. You know, one of the primary obstacles that, that women artists had to overcome was sexism, although this was certainly not unique to Paris. But since they were all studying in Paris, it's important to note that the major educational institution, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, wouldn't accept women students until 1897. Then only a select few women had their paintings and sculptures exhibited at the two major salons, the Salon des Artistes Francais and the Salon de la Société Nationale des Beaux-Arts. Many other women were either rejected outright by the salon juries or they were relegated to the so-called lesser sections where they could exhibit drawings or miniatures or watercolors. Now, when we think specifically about the Girls Art Club, we need only look at the exhibition juries for the American Women's Art Association. These juries were comprised nearly exclusively of men, mostly academy teachers or members of the Men's American Association of Paris. The gallery owners, the art critics, the gatekeepers were all men. And although many of the major male artists did accept women students and sometimes formed close relationships with them, there was always this kind of uncomfortable, sometimes misogynistic dynamic. And it was often made really explicit when they spoke to or about women artists in the press. Aside from uh, sexism, which obviously still prevails, were there any other forms of uh, discrimination that you came across in your research? Absolutely. Uh, as we traveled back in time, we inevitably discovered manners of thinking and behaving that shocked our contemporary modes of thought. As visionary as they may have been, some of Reed Hall's leaders proved to be inveterate supporters of Anglo-European supremacy. They also discredited certain categories of people based on social class, skin color, and religious or ethnic affiliation. In many respects, their ethos was grounded in exclusion and in the superiority of white American ways and means, 
favoring our own good old Anglo-Saxon stock. The club's leaders provided a safe haven for American women, but sought to ensure a high moral standard based on Protestant ethics. Mainly concerned about the Bohemian mores that prevailed in Paris, they reinforced white American values of comfort by describing the city as replete with the bag hotels and shabby rooms. And outside of the University Women's Club, they actively promoted prejudicial theories. Carrie Thomas, for example, openly advanced racism and anti-Semitism in her vision for educating women. And her vision was partially shared by Virginia Gildersleeve, who perceived Eastern European Jewish students as crude and uneducated. As a matter of fact, during her term as Dean, Barnard College, like Bryn Mawr, also required African-American women to live off campus. That's hard to listen to, so I imagine it must have been wildly disappointing to have unearthed. Going back to the Girls Art Club, there is one particularly painful incident in its history that is really necessary to acknowledge. So in the early years, many of the art club's residents were very wealthy Southern women. There was painter Willie Betty Newman, who was born on a large plantation in 1863. Her mother's family owned the Maple Grove Plantation and its 200 enslaved people near Murfreesboro, Tennessee. She was a proud member of the Daughters of the Confederacy. Another painter from that period, Maria Davies, who was also a successful novelist, was another unrepentant Confederate daughter. So we had both women living at the Girls Art Club in the 1890s, and then enter Mita Fuller, who was an African-American sculptor from Philadelphia. She came to Paris in 1899 on the advice of a family friend the noted Black painter Henry Osawa Tanner, who had already garnered critical acclaim in Paris and was a member of the Men's Art Association. Now, even before she left the U.S., Mita Fuller had made arrangements to reside at the Girls' Art Club, but when she arrived, the director at the time, Miss Ackley, was shocked to see that she was Black. And according to Fuller, Ackley actually said to her, you didn't tell me that you weren't a white girl and then explained that all of the other women at the club would not tolerate an African-American living among them. Ackley was seemingly ashamed and helped Fuller find alternate lodgings, but it was really a terrible ordeal. Now, despite this racist treatment, Fuller's studies progressed. She was quickly recognized as a talented artist. And then at the very club that had excluded her, she exhibited a bust of John the Baptist at the 1902 AWAA show. She had the honor of being the only sculptor represented at this, at this exhibition. And of course, one of the judges happened to be Henry Osawa Tanner, her old friend. So, you know, this is obviously just one story among many that we've discovered throughout our research. And as upsetting as it is, we really feel that it gives us a window into the realities of this previous century when classism and racism were just part of the dominant culture. Paris was a change of scenery for American artists, but they imported their American modes of thinking and behaving, which often led to discrimination and incidents like Mita Fuller's exclusion. So for us, I think it's really important when we tell the history of Reed Hall that we celebrate the achievements of everyone who passed through its doors, but that we also call attention to their flaws. What would you both say has been the most challenging part of this, this process, of this research? Well, one of the big challenges is that the comprehensive history of the activities at Fort Rue de Chevreuse, which really spans over two centuries and bridges at least two continents, North America and Europe, has never ever been accomplished. Its past has been silenced, scattered in innumerable fragments discovered by chance in almost forgotten news articles, correspondences, biographies, family papers, and administrative reports. In addition, inaccuracies and approximate truths, all repeated from one source to the next, 
have often misled our own forays into the past. Whenever you study women in Western history, you're bound to be challenged uh, by the way their accomplishments are minimized, their identities are recognized almost always in relation to husbands, fathers, or other male family members. And, you know, it's challenging just how much their legacies are obscured, either intentionally or because they've simply been forgotten. So our project is really an act of reclamation. We are reclaiming legacies. We are sharing the stories of so many re remarkable women. And that's a very powerful act. So after having sort of waded through some rather unfortunate discoveries, endemic to those times, and some, uh, some of which are still visible today, did you find anything that particularly surprised you? Brune, do you wanna weigh in? Yes. We discovered so many things that were surprising. For one, we had no idea that Fort Rue de Chevreuse housed the Orthopedic Center from 1824 to 1834. By sheer happenstance, Meredith came across an advertisement for this center in an obscure French newspaper, which eventually led us to a trove of medical journals describing the philosophies and practices behind orthopedic rehabilitation at that time, more specifically at Rue de Chevreuse. For another, we did not realize the extent to which American culture infused the essence of Montparnasse. Many restaurants and cafes proposed American style drinks and food. The cabarets featured jazz and blues musicians and the left bank literary community was rife with American expat writers. But the real shocker was the models market. Yeah, I don't want to just glance over that. Let's talk more about the models market. What exactly was this? How could it have possibly been legal? Don't even get me started. I have no idea about the legality of this market at the time, and it certainly would not be legal today. But in the late 1800s and up to 1914, Every Monday, men, women, and children showcased themselves along the Rue de la Grande Chaumière, right behind what is now City Hall, in the hopes of being selected to pose for local artists. They literally lined up on both sidewalks and thronged the doorways. Sculptor Janet Scudder, like other artists who resided at Four Rue de Chevreuse, benefited from such easy access to models. She recalled those models in her memoirs. All I had to do when I wanted a model was to sit at the window and look over those who came by the dozens. They were in great part Italian, though there was practically every nation under the sun represented. I used to often stop in the street before Colorossi's Academy and found myself surrounded by 50 or more little children, ranging from one year up, who immediately set up a howl to be employed as models. They had been trained from the moment they could stand on their feet for a profession that helped out the family fortunes. If you can imagine, Janet Scudder even had some of these children come to her studio in order to pose nude for her. She immortalized several in her fountain sculptures, like the one uh, on view at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So many paintings, drawings, and sculptures of that era featured these nameless individuals whose daily bread depended on the academies and studios in the neighborhood where life models, clad or unclad, were an essential calling card. Meredith, you, you wanna follow up on that? <laughs> That's a tough act to follow with the, the naked children, but... Um... You know, I was really surprised to discover that religion played such a huge role in the founding of the Girls Art Club and in the daily lives of Americans in Montparnasse. You know, it, really, St. Luke's Chapel, which I used to think of as this kind of separate entity plopped down in the garden of the Girls Art Club, was there first. Affectionately called the Little Tin Church, St. Luke's opened in 1892 as the only English language house of worship on the left bank. The rector of Holy Trinity, Reverend Dr. Morgan, worked closely with Elizabeth Mills Reed when he leased that small plot of land on which the chapel sat from the Keller family. 
Then donations from the American colony paid for the sparse furnishings at St. Luke's. And it really kind of functioned as an outpost of Holy Trinity, catering to the, the younger crowd that was in Montparnasse. So weekly mass in the garden chapel was as much a part of life at the girls art club as were their famous afternoon teas. And I also discovered that the chapel was named for St. Luke because he was the patron saint of artists and students. Nice. Um, would you both like to kind of close out some final words, anything you'd like to add? Rune, you wanna start? Absolutely. Um, in a capital city and country where the majority of important places and streets are named after men, it is most rewarding to be associated with Reed Hall, which bears the name of its founder and most ardent supporter, Elizabeth Mills Reed. Thanks to her, and because of her belief in women's creative energy and intellectual prowess, many women acquired agency here and succeeded in shaping much of the evolution of what has become a global center for study, research, and public programming. Our website will pay tribute to their contributions, which are too often forgotten with the passage of time and the ever evolving initiatives that compose Reed Hall's mission. When Mrs. Reed died in 1931, a former club resident published an anonymous tribute to her in the New York Herald Tribune. This resident, of course, waxed poetic about Reed Hall as everyone does, talked about the gardens, the architecture, the roles of film she had used when taking photographs. But then she referred to everyone who had ever been to Reed Hall in any era as a procession of famous and obscure people. And I think this really perfectly encapsulates the countless individuals who have found a home or a headquarters at Four Rue de Chevreuse. Our research has enabled us to discover, you know, untold chapters in the lives of many famous figures, but also to give voices to those obscure, all of whom had nothing in common except their shared experience at this old house in Paris. Um, the tribute said about Mrs. Reed, you know, there was never anyone like her. And I have certainly come to realize that there is no place anywhere like Reed Hall. I think we would both agree with you. So thank you, Brune. Thank you, Meredith, um, not only for participating in this webinar, but most importantly for your unceasing dedication to this project and for bringing these exceptional women and their stories to the fore. To those of you watching who would like to find out more, the Reed Hall History website will be live by fall 2021. So in the meantime, keep an eye on the CGC Paris website and our social media accounts for further information. Thanks for joining us.